Joining me here today is our Miles Bruder and Zan Gormley. Miles represents clients in significant corporate transactions, principally including mergers and acquisitions, complex commercial contracts, entity formation and capitalization, corporate debt and equity finance and incentive, incentive compensation arrangements. He benefits from a diversity of perspectives gained from counseling businesses of all sizes. He serves as outside general counsel to emerging and middle market clients, helping their leadership to cultivate and realize business objectives while sensibly balancing and mitigating the risk inherent in growth. Zan is an accomplished litigator with extensive experience in several different practice areas and jurisdictions. While Zan handles many kinds of litigation, his primary areas of practice are in commercial litigation, ERISA, and professional liability. He does not work with one specific type of client or industry. Instead, the common thread in his work is resolving complex disputes for businesses and hardworking individuals to allow them to concentrate on what they do best. Welcome, Miles and Zan. The floor is yours now. Thanks very much, Amish. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, a few quick notes on what we'll be covering in this session. Uh, we'll start with a little background on the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, particularly Article 2, uh, to give you a clear idea of the context in which a battle of the forms can occur before we dig into the law that governs the battle of the forms. Okay, We'll cover three key sections of Article 2 of the UCC that apply to the battle of the forms. Section 204 gives foundational principles governing the formation of contracts. Section 201 codifies the statute of frauds for application to the sale of goods. Um, that's, of course, everybody knows the requirement that the party to be charged with a contract must have signed a writing evidencing the contract. And then we'll spend most of our time digging into Section 207, uh, which establishes the rules for contract formation and interpretation that are specific to the Battle of the Forms scenario, which is what we're concerned with in this session this afternoon. We'll follow the review of the law with a few hypotheticals uh, toward the end of the session that will demonstrate some of the rules in action. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions. If you come up with any, you can submit them uh, at the bottom of the screen as Amish has described. And Zan and I will be sure to follow up with you on answers uh, on those questions if we do not have time to get to them during the session. Um, this is a lot of material, but we'll move as quickly as we can. Uh, before we dive in, I want to give one more reminder that we'll have three different polling questions for you during the session on this subject matter. We'll do our best to draw your attention to those uh, when they come up, but please make sure you respond so you can get credit for this session. All right, so let's dig in. A um, little background on Article 2. So the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, is a model set of laws that govern commercial transactions published and continually updated by the Uniform Laws Commission. Um, it's a model set of rules. So it doesn't have the effect of law, except through codification by each of the states. All 50 states have adopted the UCC, but many have made their own adjustments to the code and all have different judicial interpretations of the code adopted through the years. In North Carolina, the UCC is codified at Chapter 25 of the General Statutes. Um, today, we'll talk about the prevailing majority versions of the codes themselves and the interpretations of those codes adopted in most jurisdictions. But as with all fields of law, you know, we want to remain aware of the jurisdiction in which you're applying these principles. There may be variances. Article 2 of the UCC specifically governs the sale of goods. Goods under Article 2 are all things that are movable at the time of identification to the contract for sale, okay? Examples can be anything from manufactured products to food, to chemicals, to parts, um, minerals. Um, goods generally do not include services, and they also don't include, for this purpose, the Article 2 does not apply to contracts that are hybrid contracts for the sale of goods and services. Very important point to keep in mind. Uh, goods don't include negotiable instruments, real property, fixtures to the real property, right? This is all important context to remember. We're going to be dealing with some uh, 
law today that you shouldn't assume always applies to your exchanges of standard form contracts. Um, these apply only to transactions in the sale of goods. Uh, so before you reach for these rules, you know, you need to be focused on that being the context. And then keep in mind that this is dealing with transactions in the United States exclusively. Uh, it doesn't mean that these rules may not apply if you have a foreign party to the transaction, but if you do have a foreign party to the transaction, you need to understand what the laws apply in that jurisdiction and be aware of some of the international conventions that may apply as well. Uh, we won't get into that but keep that context in mind. One of the key achievements of Article 2 was the elimination of the mirror image rule for the sale of goods. Um, the mirror image rule was a common law principle, I should say is a common law principle, um, that requires the terms of an acceptance to be identical to the terms of the offer in order for a contract to exist. Under that law, under that rule, if the acceptance deviates from the offer, by inserting additional or conflicting terms, it's a counteroffer and no contract is formed, right? So understand that as the background to the introduction of the rules in Article 2 that we'll discuss today. And know that that mirror image rule, again, still applies in other contexts, like the sale of services, or contracts for services. Um, Article 2 also includes certain rules that are specific to transactions between merchants. That definition is important to keep in mind because some of the rules that we'll discuss today are different when two merchants are involved. A merchant under the code is a person who deals in goods of the kind or otherwise by his occupation holds himself out as having knowledge or skill peculiar to the practices of goods involved in the transaction or to whom such knowledge or skill may be attributed by his employment of an agent or broker or other intermediary who by his occupation holds himself out as having such knowledge or skill. So you have to know what's going on in that particular transaction to be a merchant, have seen it before, or use a third party who has seen and done it before. So again, it's important because it changes some of the rules that apply just because it's business to business, business, don't assume that it's merchant to merchant, right? So be aware of that context and that definition. Article 2 also establishes certain terms that are included in a contract between a buyer and a seller and the remedies available in the event of a breach. Um, we'll touch on these at a high level today uh, when we get into the application of rules that govern battle of the forms. Um, but these are fallback terms and, and remedies that are established by the statute that, that are not our focus today. Just understand that they exist, and we'll talk about how they play into this battle of the form scenario in a minute. Uh, and finally, Article 2 favors finding a contract where possible. That's an important principle to keep in mind about Article 2 in general. Um, as you'll see when we dig into this scenario, the rules are going to... to encourage the existence of a contract uh, wherever possible. Okay, um, that brings us to our first polling question. Um, this is our first opportunity to make sure you're all paying attention and haven't slipped into a post-lunch nap. Um, the question is, what is the mirror image rule? Is it a statutory rule that a party seeking to enforce a contract must have an original copy of the contract? Is it the name of a high charting single from 1980 by the English beat? Is it a common law principle that the terms of an offer and acceptance must be the same for a contract to be formed? Please respond. We'll give you just a minute to do so. You're doing well so far. All right, a couple more seconds here. It looks like we've got good responses. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you got this right. It's the common law principle that the terms of an offer and acceptance must be the same for a contract to be formed. Again, that's the mirror image rule. And remember, it still exists. Article two did away with that for the sale of goods, but not for everything. Um, so I'll turn it over to Zan to introduce sections 204 and 201 on the topic of contract formation. Take it away, Zan. Thank you, Jeff. 
Thanks, Miles. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. I noticed that at least one person went for the English beat. So we've got a, a good crowd out there today. And hope you appreciated that question. It was somewhat of a softball, but um, it's good to have a little fun while we're talking about what could be viewed as a dry topic, but which Miles and I obviously think is fascinating. So Miles talked about the three sections we're going to focus on today. The battle of the forms is really embodied in section 2207, but before we get to that, you got to talk about 2204 and 2201. 2204 is really piggybacking off the last point in Miles' slide, which says the UCC favors the formation of a contract. And I always, whenever I look at a statute or a law, like to consider the context in which it was made. And the UCC did a lot of things for good. And one of those was getting rid of this confusion that can result when you've got paper and discussions flying back and forth in the course of commerce. Obviously, sales of goods between merchants are not as always cut and dry as they are between you know, uh, an accountant and his client, a doctor and his patient, right? They're things that happen at the speed of business and they can happen very quickly. And it was just a mess sometimes as to whether or not contracts have been formed. So what the UCC did was said, hey, let's get rid of the mirror image rule and let's promote a series of rules and concepts that get us towards the equitable idea that, look, we had an agreement and you knew it. And if we had an agreement and both parties knew it, then we're going to enforce that agreement and we'll come up with clever and fair ways, I think, to sort of sort out what the terms of the agreement are. And that's really what the battle of the forms gets to. So 2204, in essence, embodies that principle. And it talks about how a contract is formed generally. So the first subsection of that deals with a contract for sale of goods may be made in any manner sufficient to show agreement, including conduct by both parties, which recognizes the existence of such a contract. Conduct is really important, and we'll get to that more when we get to the Battle of the Forms and 2207. Um, what it also said is, look, an agreement can be formed even though the exact moment it was made is undetermined, right? Under the mirror image rule, it's, I offer you this under these exact terms, and the other party says, I accept. Well, there you go. You have a contract. Again, sale of goods, moving at the speed of business, not always quite clear. So the UCC got rid of that, which is really part and parcel of the mirror image rule and just said, look, even if you can't figure out the exact moment, if both parties knew there was a contract or showed that they thought there was a contract, after a certain point, we're going to say there's a contract. Um, and unlike under common law, when a contract can fail for indefiniteness, you know, it's really more of an agreement to agree. Under the UCC, even though one or more terms are left open, a contract for sale does not fail for indefiniteness if the parties have intended to make a contract and there is a reasonably certain basis for giving an appropriate remedy under that contract. So you're probably saying, oh, well, great. That doesn't sound very fair. I could be found to have agreed to something in my sleep, right? Not necessarily true. And that's why this deals with formation in general, laying out the concepts, but 2201 deals with the more formal requirements. So let's go to that next slide, please. And again, 2201 is much more detailed than this slide. Uh, I was remembering that when I was getting ready for this presentation and I reviewed it in detail. Had been a while since I had to pull it exactly because I sort of just know what it generally says. But what it says is, look, you've got to have a writing of some sort to demonstrate that a contract has been formed. Now, again, conduct can still allow for the inference and the fact that a contract has been formed, but you still have to have some sort of writing. And as we'll see and discuss in some hypotheticals, it's usually something in the way of a purchase order or an invoice or perhaps a request for a quote that then leads to an exchange of paper. Um, again, it doesn't have to be what we think of as a formal agreement where it specifies all the terms and both parties sign it, or at least one party signs it, but there does need to be some kind of right. Um, and it does that to encourage parties to put their agreements in writing. So at bottom, you know the fundamentals of what the parties were discussing. Um, however, that only applies to contracts for the sale of goods greater than $500. 
if it's less than $500, you could still potentially have a contract without a writing. Um, again, meeting these requirements, though, doesn't necessarily mean a contract exists. You still have to show that the parties have agreed to reasonably sufficient terms. Again, the contract won't fail for lack of definiteness, but you still have to have some level of detail. You can't just say, oh, well, we he agreed that he would sell me everything and I would buy it based on whatever prevailing price existed that day. You have to have some writing. So again, a, a lot of times statutes and case law particularly don't necessarily make sense in a vacuum, but when you consider the context of why this statute was passed, it's really, again, to kind of promote fairness and efficiency in transactions of goods. And what I really like about it is you strip away a lot of the legalese and the verbiage, and it really comes down to, all right, what did the parties really agree to here? And the UCC gave parties and courts in turn flexibility to follow that approach. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Mr. Bruder. All right, thank you, Zan. Um, okay, so we'll now turn to our fact pattern that Zan alluded to, uh, that is what we're focused on most today. It's the battle of the forms. Um, it's a recurring common scenario uh, that brings up the question of contract formation and contract interpretation, and it occurs so commonly it gets its own special rules. Uh, why is it a battle? Uh, well, it, it typically involves a conflict between the standard forms used by both parties uh, that are exchanged between, between those parties during contract negotiations. These parties, obviously, in this scenario are buyer of goods and seller of goods, because again, we're living in Article 2 of the UCC. Um, the common battle of the forms scenario and the potential that disputes that it can create is that buyer issues its standard purchase order or the provision um, in this example that requires arbitration of all disputes. Well, instead of signing the PO, a seller responds by issuing its invoice, which has a Delaware choice of law and venue provision in small print at the bottom. Um, parties might also differ on other terms in their standard forms like product quality, warranties, time for delivery, damage limitations and all sorts of other terms that you tend to negotiate when you have an opportunity to do so. Um, parties exchange those forms, seller ships the goods, buyer accepts. Later on, a dispute over the, the goods arises and they need to go to dispute resolution. Well, what happens? Is there a contract? And if, if so, which terms prevail? Those are the two fundamental questions that we'll come back to at various points in this discussion, and that 207 exists to resolve in the common scenarios. Is there an enforceable contract? And if there is, what are the contract terms? As you can imagine, there are innumerable permutations to this example. We'll go through a few of those hypotheticals at the end of the session, but let's dig into 207 and the way that it establishes rules for resolving those two fundamental questions. Before we get to that slide, um, we've got our second polling question. And our second polling question, see if you were paying attention at the beginning, is true or false, all 50 states have adopted the UCC as state law. We'll give you a minute to answer these questions. Again, please remember, this is uh, necessary for you to get CLE credit for this session, so please respond. No harm in being wrong. Let's just see what everybody thinks. It looks like numbers that are pretty consistent with the responses to the first. So I'm going to assume that we've got responses from everybody at this point. We can end that poll. And it's split pretty evenly. 51% um, and 49% were, were right down the middle. 
The answer is true. All 50 states have adopted the UCC, but I thought this might be the case, and I find it interesting. We're dealing with a room full of virtual room full of lawyers. Um, in the broadest sense, the answer is true. All 50 states have adopted the UCC, but you know, you being lawyers, you could interpret this question as false because not all 50 states have adopted the UCC in exactly the same manner. Um, so I'll give some credit to the folks who said that this is false. Um, but as a reminder, all 50 states have adopted the, the UCC in general, but you do need to remain mindful of the way that the particular state that's governing your transaction has adopted it and interpreted it through the, the court decisions over the years. Okay, we can move on to the next slide, uh, which is 207 and the text of 207. And we'll spend a minute here reviewing the text because it gives you the foundation for what we'll talk about uh, and the details of this. This is our basic rule book for officiating the battle of the forms. This is a loaded section. Um, and we'll spend the rest of the time on this section it's, itself. It covers a lot of different variable scenarios um, that all start with the parties trading one or more sets of proposed terms and conditions in connection with the possible sale of goods transaction. So again, that's what the battle of forms is. And when you see that transpire and you're dealing with the sale of goods in the United States, this is the section that comes to mind. It's got three parts, okay? And remember our two fundamental questions. Is there a contract? And if so, what are its terms? And each of these play in, into those two questions differently. Part one addresses the first question, is there a contract, okay? It says a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance or written confirmation, which is sent within a reasonable time, operates as an acceptance, even though it states terms additional to or different from those offered or agreed upon, unless acceptance is expressly made conditional on assent to the additional or different terms. Okay, again, that's an answer to the question of, is there a contract? And what it says is, yes, there's a contract, unless acceptance is expressly conditional. And we'll dig into that in a minute. Part two deals with the question of what terms apply when part one yields a contract. It says additional terms are to be construed as proposals for addition of the contract, but between merchants, and there's that term that we talked about at the beginning, such terms become part of the contract unless the offer expressly limits acceptance to the terms of the offer, they materially alter it, or notification of objection to them has already been given or is given within a reasonable time after notice of them is received. Those are key exceptions to the principle that those additional terms will become part of the contract and Zan will dig into those in a few minutes. Part three addresses the scenario in which the trading of the documents may not be enough to give rise to the contract but it acknowledges that the parties can go on and create a contract through their performance. And then it talks about what terms of the contract or what the terms of the contract will be in that scenario. So it says conduct by both parties, which recognizes the existence of a contract is sufficient to establish a contract for sale. Although the writings of the parties do not otherwise establish a contract. In such case, the terms of the particular contract consist of those terms on which the writings of the parties agree together with any supplementary terms incorporated under any other provisions of the act. All right, so let's move on to the next slide and we'll dig into part one, okay? First, the question of contract formation in the battle of forms. As we outlined in the fact pattern a couple of minutes ago, we have one party, prospective buyer, submitting a purchase order with its own pre-printed terms and conditions proposed to govern the purchase. To a seller who responds with its own quote, or invoice confirming the sale, but including different pre-printed terms. Okay, inevitably, seller's forms are going to have seller favorable terms that are either additional to or different from the terms in buyer's form. So this is where we remember that Article 2 generally favors finding a contract where possible. And that gives you some color for why 2071 says what it says. 2071 is focused on validating the seller's acceptance despite it containing any mix of additional or different terms. 
not just containing additional terms, it can also contain terms that are different. Recall the old mirror image rule would have invalidated that acceptance, okay? So that's why Article 2 is important. And remember, mirror image rule still applies to the context of services or a hybrid services and goods agreement, right? So you still need to remind yourself in that scenario, if we're introducing the concept of services or something other than goods to the transaction, this may not be our result. All right, timely acceptance. Before we move on from part one, I wanna give some attention to the first part of this section. The battle of the forms analysis is always focused on what happens with additional and different terms in the seller's acceptance. But before we even get to that point, the seller's acceptance has to be timely. So, you know, the first part of the statement says that acceptance or a written confirmation, which is sent within a reasonable time, operates as the acceptance. Well, it's seasonal when it is sent at or within the agreed time, and this is under 204 that Zan referenced before, or if there's no agreed time, it's within a reasonable time. And what is a reasonable time is a question of fact that depends on the nature, purpose, and circumstances of the, of the transaction at hand, okay? So don't just jump straight to, we have a contract because seller accepted, you have to have done it in a timely fashion first in your analysis. So let's move on to the next slide and recall, right, that it's possible, even likely, that an offeree does not want its response to serve as an acceptance of buyer's offer, okay? Because even though they have a contract, the rest of 207, which we'll get into in a minute, may result in contract terms being different from what the offeree intends. So let's refocus on the second part of that 2071. The offerees additional and different terms are still acceptance unless acceptance is expressly made conditional on assent to the additional or different terms. When the offeree does this, makes its acceptance expressly conditional, the offeree is treated as making a counteroffer and no contract exists. All right, it resets the fact pattern by changing which party has made the offer. This is one point where I want you to really focus on the words. The words matter here. The details matter here. Jurisdictions are pretty uniform in requiring that conditional acceptance will be a counteroffer only if the language in the offeree's acceptance directly and distinctly states that its acceptance is conditional on the offeror accepting the additional or different terms. You can't leave it to chance. You can't say that when you deliver the document. You can't say it in an email that covers the document when you email it. Um, it needs to be crystal clear. So this is one point where form matters over function. So if the offeree does not condition its response, we get to the second part of our question, which is we have a contract, but what are its terms, all right? The answer depends on how the terms of the offeree's response compare with the terms of the original offer. Are they additional terms, which have no comparable provision in the original offer? Or are they different terms, which conflict with or are in some way different from that comparable term in the original offer? Zane will cover the additional terms rules in a couple of minutes. Um, for now, understand that the basic principle is that between merchants, and remember the merchant is somebody with specialty knowledge or experience in the industry, or somebody who's associated with a third party that has that knowledge or experience. Between merchants, the terms automatically become a part of the contract unless an exception applies, which Zane will cover. If it's a non-merchant involved in the transaction, those additional terms are only proposals and are excluded unless the offeror, the original buyer in our scenario, expressly assents to those terms. Different and conflicting terms are treated differently. Different and conflicting terms between the offer and acceptance cancel each other out and they're automatically supplemented or replaced by the UCC's default fallback provisions, which are known as gap filler provisions, right? 
unless those gap filler provisions are themselves explicitly excluded from the contract by the terms of each party's writing that agree on that topic. So they might both say, we don't want the gap fillers to apply, um, in which case those gap fillers will not apply. But that's less common that you're going to have that in both scenarios and preprinted forms. For obvious reasons, this is commonly known as the knockout rule. Okay. In the case of the knockout rule, applying to exclude terms where we haven't said the gap fillers will not apply and we can go to the next slide. You do need to be aware of what those gap fillers are and we could spend an entire day on all of these. And we're not going to focus heavily on those, um, but just as a few examples, um, they cover a wide range of terms to fill in terms of the contract that, that aren't part of the party's writings agreed upon under the other rules. They can include price, delivery specifics. Um, and those delivery specifics go beyond the obvious issues like time and place of delivery. They extend to details like requirements that a seller tender the entire purchase quantity in a single delivery, which could enable the buyer to reject goods if delivery does not take place in a single shipment, right? Their operational details, and this is the principle to remember, that no seller should leave to chance, which is why you don't want to find yourself in this position in most cases. You don't want to rely on some of these default provisions because most people don't have them front of mind. Those people assume they're doing business on their terms. Same issues for limitations and disclaimers of certain amounts and types of damages and certain implied warranties that exist under the gap fillers. Um, you see reference here to the course of performance, course of dealing and uses of trade. Those are important concepts that are specific to the parties in the industry at issue that could be used to fill in gaps in the terms of their express contract. Of course, performance involves repeat performance by either party after contract form formation. Of course, of dealing involves conduct between the parties generally before uh, contract formation that could inform their expectations. Um, for example, if the parties in the past have treated a contracted order quantity as variable and subject to future adjustment based on external factors, then Article two may require a seller to accept a buyer's reduced quantity purchase, purchase quantity uh, in lieu of the quantity that was specified in buyer's original purchase order. Um, so again, reasons that you want to avoid the application of these gap fillers. Uh, we can spend all day on gap fillers. We need to move on uh, and focus on, on the next phase of, of this discussion. But before we do that, and before I turn it over to Zan to talk about additional terms um, and, and the rules that apply to additional terms, we'll get to our final polling question. Um, final polling question here, everybody wake up, is when there are different or conflicting terms between the offer and acceptance, what happens under UCC 2207 part one? The buyer's terms prevail unless they are considered unconscionable. The conflicting terms knock each other out and are supplemented by the UCC's gap fillers, or the seller's terms prevail unless they materially alter the contract. I'll give you another 20 seconds or so, see what everybody thinks. seeing very good participation you're all you're all going to get credit for this congratulations so the answer here is b <clears throat> conflicting terms knock each other out and are supplemented by the ucc's gap fillers real quickly before we move on i want to make one note and this gets back to jurisdictional awareness for anybody who did select c that sellers terms prevail i want to take a quick moment to acknowledge that there are different approaches in certain jurisdictions on this topic. A minority of jurisdictions, including notably California, um, treat additional terms and different terms equally when considering the battle of the forms scenario under 2072. 
right? So that is the different terms wouldn't cancel out the terms in the offer or offer, um, but the different terms may become part of the contract. Um, it being California, I'm not versed in how that would apply, um, but I think it is something to be aware of, uh, you know, and a reminder that there can be differing interpretations of these of these very general application rules. So we'll get on to the rules on additional terms. Zan, take it away, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're dealing with subsection two here, and this deals with additional terms. With the knockout rule, you're talking about different terms, right? So different terms, Miles walked through that. We're out of the realm of different terms. We're now additional terms. So let's kind of zoom out before we zoom in. So subsection one says, look, there's an offer, there's a response. The response includes additional or different terms. You got an agreement, okay? Now, what do we do with the additional and different terms? Well, Miles just told you what you do with the different terms. In most states, most jurisdictions, you apply the knockout rule. 2207, two says what you do with the additional terms. You're probably saying, well, what does the statute say about different terms? It's probably mine, maybe Miles' as biggest as beef with the statute. The statute doesn't say anything about different terms and the knockout rule itself is actually common law that's been developed, but we can take that up with the UCC powers that be later. What's nice is that at least it has a really clear rule on additional terms. So between non-merchants or in the transaction, not between merchants, additional terms are construed as proposals. Okay. They don't automatically become a part of the contract. They're construed as proposals and they don't become part of the contract unless the offeror expressly agrees to them. So the initial party gets some additional terms and unless he expressly agrees to them, they don't become part of the contract. As between a contract between merchants though, those additional terms will automatically become part of the contract unless one of the following three exception applies, okay? The offer expressly limits acceptance to the terms of the offer. So the initial offer says, hey, take it or leave it, no additional terms. Um, if the response or the additional terms materially alter the underlying offer, or if notification of objection to additional terms has already been given or is given within a reasonable time after notice of them is received. So let's say you got a situation of you get the offer, you get the response that accepts it, but includes these additional terms. Maybe in that interim, the buyer and seller talked and somebody and the buyer said, hey, look, person who made the offer, I'm not going to include any additional or allow for any additional terms. That would be given within a reasonable time um, before notice is received. And then obviously a reasonable time after notice is received is, is easy enough to imagine. So we'll talk about A, B, and C, each one of these exceptions in more detail, starting with the next slide. So exception one is when the offer limits acceptance to the original terms. So this is a situation in which the acceptance adds terms and you say, all right, well, what do we do with those? And again, we're talking about transactions between merchants. Um, that would be a situation where, let's say, the buyer issues a purchase order that expressly limits acceptance to its terms. The seller responds with an invoice that adds a damages limitation provision and makes acceptance conditional on the buyer's agreement to that provision. In that situation, the seller's invoice is a counteroffer and the damages limitation does not become automatically part of the contract. In that situation, the buyer would have to agree to that counteroffer. So that's sort of a working example of how this first exception would work. So let's go to the second exception. This is where the additional terms create a material change to the underlying contract or offer. That would include things like any change to the price, to the quantity of the goods, to the quality of the goods, or the delivery, place, time. 
that would include warranty disclaimers, right? Take the goods as is. These goods are only going to be good for the following purposes. Related limitations on liability. You know, you know your liability is li limited to the price of the goods, not you know, excluding consequential damages or other things like that. Um, or terms that impose different permutations on dispute resolution, maybe which choice of law replies, applies, which forum is going to have to apply, and attorney's fee shifting provisions. Um, it's easy to see how those could not automatically become and should not automatically become part of the contract as between merchants. So if a term is material, obviously it doesn't jump out on its face and say, this is a material term. A party is going to have to object if the dispute arises and show why it's material. So generally, the party opposing a material additional term will have that burden, and they usually carry the burden of showing materiality by establishing that the term will result in surprise or hardship to the party against whose those terms are going to be imposed if it becomes part of the contract. And you'll see time and time again, that's really what courts focus on in materiality analysis, it's really the surprise and the hardship. Not surprisingly, surprise often arises and is proven in the case of fine print. So we're all attorneys and we think, hey, everybody should have to read whatever I put, but obviously burying things in fine print, especially additional terms that material alter, materially alter the contract, the court's not gonna be so happy about those and will strike those and say that those did not become part of the contract. So, like we say there in the last point, if it's considered material, the term will not automatically become part of the contract. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. And this is, like I said, this is just an example of a few cases that have applied this analysis on materiality. So in Patrol versus Valair in Eastern District of Washington State, there the court was focused on the unilateral, so one party had added additional terms, a form selection clause. The court said, listen, that is a material term. We're not going to enforce that, especially because it was only vaguely referenced in some fine print in purchase orders. Pretty, pretty easy to see why that would not automatically become part of the contract, even as between merchants sophisticated in sales of goods and dealing with each other. Next case, Pfizer versus Monoblock, that was out of the Delaware court. Boilerplate language was used in the memo that was the accepting writing. And the court said, look, it's boilerplate language. Once again, it's fine print. We're not going to allow the parties to rely on that and the party whose boilerplate that was to say that this became a part of the contract because it's material and it's an additional term. And because of that, it would create unfair surprise and hardship and would material alter the contract. So that's a very good statement of the law. That's a really good case. Delaware, as, as many of us know, has a lot of business disputes, the Delaware Court of Chancery, also the Delaware Superior Court. So you get a lot of really good cases on the UCC in Delaware. And then there's ProMold versus ESI. That was out of the federal court in Utah. And again, we're, we're talking about terms here that were material, that were additional, and they weren't expressly made and brought up front to the counterparty. They were incorporated by reference to a vague document that wasn't part of the writings that the parties were really focused on. So the court said, uh-uh, that's unfair. It's going to work a surprise. It's material. Get rid of it. So these are instances in which, and again, like I think with the UCC, there is a certain level of logic and uh, equity to these concepts. And I think these cases are really good examples of that. So next slide, please. And then we're dealing with the third exception, which is if the additional terms are objected to within a reasonable time. What constitutes a reasonable time is not stated in the statute, obviously. It's a question of fact that depends on the nature and circumstances of each particular transaction, including the party's course of dealing, right? What, what do the parties normally do when they're going back and forth? Do they have to say basically within a day or two typically whether they object to these terms or is their practice to 
let things sit and then come back after a little while and rework the terms, right? And then also, what's the usages of trade, right? Some goods are shipped very quickly. They are mass produced widgets, let's call them. You know, maybe microprocessors would be a great example of that. There, you're getting orders for thousands, hundreds of thousands of these things a day. Clearly, I think the usage of trade in that industry would be you got to object within a couple hours, maybe within a day. You can't reject or object you know, days or months after the fact because that's not how the trade in the context of that business operates. And again, you look at the party's course of performance. Well, did they accept the goods, use them, and then object? Okay. I think in that case, you'd say your objecting was not within a reasonable time. It was unseasonable. Um, so that takes us through these exceptions. And with that, we'll go to the next slide. And this is back to Mr. Miles. All right, thank you, Zan. Um, we'll touch real quickly because I want to give some time to get into some of these hypotheticals on part three of 207. Uh, and part three gets into what happens when there is not a contract formed between the two writings, right? So this would be seller's acceptance is expressly conditioned with the magic language that we talked about earlier on um, the buyer's acceptance of the seller's different additional terms. The buyer fails to respond, uh, chooses not to respond, thinks it has a deal, ignores the terms. Um, in that scenario, you've got a counteroffer with no acceptance of the counteroffer. What are the terms? Well, 2073 says, if they go on to behave as though they've formed a contract, you have a contract. Question one. Question two, what are the terms of the contract? Well, the terms of the contract in that scenario are the terms on which the two writings agree, right? So some of the basic contract terms might be consistent between the two, um, but a lot of the material contract terms might be different. And where those are different, they are not part of the contract and you are stuck relying on the UCC's gap filler provisions, right? So that's where the gap fillers come in uh, and become important for you. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, this is an example for you um, of what kind of problem can arise in that scenario for uh, a seller who might be relying on its invoices to override the terms of the buyer's purchase order. Um, but if the buyer fails to respond, that's not going to happen. Um, if they go on to, to perform as though they have a contract, um, they'll be facing terms that they didn't expect to be dealing with in the form of gap filler provisions. Uh, so let's let's jump jump in, Dan, to the to the hypotheticals. I'll turn it back over to you for the first one. Um, I think we'll get to some examples of um, of everything we've talked about. Uh, let's run through those as quickly as we can with the time we have remaining. Yeah, that's a good idea, and, and I think we'll want to do one and two, and then maybe jump so we can cover other concepts. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Okay, so hypotheticals, everyone's favorite thing going back to law school. Um, putting this presentation together, Miles and I realized why law professors love hypotheticals, because uh, they're a good way to encapsulate the concepts and they're a good way to get people thinking and talking. So here you've got a situation in which uh, we're talking about merchant to merchant, right? So the buyer issues a request for a quote, says, hey, I want to buy a um, thousand widgets, give me a quote as to how much that they would cost. The seller issues that. Let's say it contains the seller's terms and conditions. We still don't have a contract, right? This is just the seller saying, here's what I would sell those to you for. And here's the conditions on which I would sell this. The buyer at that point then says, great, let's do it. Here's my purchase order. That, however, also contains the buyer's terms and conditions. So you're thinking, all right, well, battle the forms, right? We're dealing with competing battles of uh, the forms here. And additionally, his purchase order limits acceptance to the terms of the offer and objects to any additional or different terms. So at that point, we don't have a contract. The seller, right? Because it's a limited acceptance to the terms of the offer. The seller is going to have to expressly accept it. And 
if he does, then you'll have a contract is formed under 2207, right? But then it's a question of, okay, we've got a contract that's formed under 22071. What do we do with these conflicting terms, these terms and conditions? And because we're dealing with a transaction between merchants, we're going to use the knockout rule. That would also apply between non-merchants, but in this particular situation, it would apply. So the conflicting terms and the terms and conditions, they're going to knock each other out. And then for the additional terms, what do we do, right? Well, we know as between merchants, additional terms automatically become part of the contract unless one of those three exceptions applies. So here you'd have to look and see, do any of these exceptions apply? And that would really be looking at, since we didn't have um, notification or objection, we'd really look to a material alteration. And that's what you would do in this situation. So that is kind of a working example of how you would look to 2207 to resolve or get to really the question about which terms and conditions apply in this particular scenario. So next slide and back to Miles. So we'll put a little bit of a different spin on that fact pattern, okay? Um, let's say buyer is Jungle Gym Company. Jungle Gym Company sends out an RFP for a thousand new tire swings to be incorporated into Jungle Gym's new backyard swing set. Used tire company responds to the RFP with a quote, thousand tire swings at $50 a piece. Jungle Gym says, nobody's better, let's do it. They send Jungle Gym's standard PO to use tire, 1,000 swings, $50 a piece. Being a sophisticated operation this time, use tire, or excuse me, um, Jungle Gym includes, as, that, as Zan explained in the prior uh, scenario, that magic language conditions its purchase order on seller's acceptance of those terms, okay? So that's your offer. But this time, before used tire does anything to act on that offer, it's got a sales team that knows what it's doing. It sends a sales order confirmation, 1,000 tire swings, $50 a piece. But this time, it says our acceptance is conditional on Jungle Gym's assent to our standard terms of sale. All right, there's your magic language. They do it right. And I think this is a scenario that's probably more likely to occur, especially when you're dealing with two sophisticated parties that have consulted counsel that attended this CLE, and they each include the magic language saying it's their terms or the highway. Um, so you're gonna have an offer and a counter offer exchanged instead of an offer and acceptance in that scenario. Buyer does nothing when it gets the sales order. Procurement team wasn't coached up to look for that seller's disclaimer conditioning the seller's offer on seller's terms. So buyer thinks it has a deal in hand on buyer's terms. The ops team is in the background, working away, making its jungle gyms in reliance on those tire swings coming in when they need them. This is why it's important for your teams on the front lines who do battle with the paper that you may have given them, right? To understand some of these basic concepts and the terms to look for when they're trading paper. If seller did nothing at that point, buyer would be totally in the dark. Seller's counter offer wasn't accepted. Seller isn't obligated to act on it. You have no contract under 2071. But we know that non-action is unlikely, right? We have a motivated seller. So let's say used tire gets to work on our tire swings, turns around and orders a thousand tires from its critical supplier of those tires, junkyard dogs. All right. Well, let's say. In that situation, we've got a contract formed under 2073 because the seller has taken action um, demonstrating the existence of a contract. But what are its terms? Let's say Jungle Gym's purchase order said the swing set, um, you know, delivery needed to be at its swing set assembly facility 30 days from the time the PO was placed but used tire sales confirmation, which was conditioned on acceptance of its terms, conflicts on that point of time and place of delivery. It says, we'll deliver at our manufacturing facility and we have concerns about our own supply chain limitations. Surprise, surprise, we'll deliver in 90 days. 
Well, those two terms don't agree with each other. So you apply 2073, which only incorporates into the contract the terms on which the party's writings agree, and those delivery terms are out the door. So you're left with the gap filler provisions that we talked about earlier. Under the gap filler provision that would apply to delivery, which is section 309, it calls for delivery to be made within a reasonable time. There's that ambig ambiguous fact-specific inquiry again, right? Goes without saying, that's a question of fact and nobody wants to find them disputing that, especially in a contract of this size, right? Point is, you want to implement provisions or procedures and standard terms that are gonna minimize your risk of finding yourself in this position. So I'll turn it back over to Zan for the next scenario. Thanks, Miles. Yeah, and we're starting to come up on the break and, and probably need to leave a little, a few minutes for questions. So I, I've got a bunch of details, facts that's even better than Miles' jungle gym scenario, but I'm gonna just kind of jump right into the, the nuts and bolts of this. So here's another one. And I like this one because it, it gets into um, when you have really fine distinction between uh, different terms. So here you've got the purchase order, it's for a hundred widgets. It's got the buyer standard terms and conditions. The seller's invoice, it tracks the purchase, it tracks that invoice. Um, I'm sorry, it tracks the purchase order on all the terms, the big terms, price, quantity, and delivery. But it's got its own terms and conditions and fine print at the bottom. So here we go. We've got the battle of forms. And are we going to have the knockout rule here? So the buyer inspects the shipment and half the widgets are broken. He informs the seller of the defect seven days after receiving them and 12 days after shipment. Well, unfortunately, that was within the buyer's terms and conditions, but not within the seller's. The seller's terms and conditions say 10 days from shipment to inspect. The buyer said 10 days from delivery to inspect. So what do we do in this situation? What's going to happen? I think we can all agree after all this time here today the battle of the forms and the knockout rule is gonna apply. So let's go to the next slide. And that's exactly right. So the terms are different as to the time for inspecting, right? And since they're different, the court's gonna apply the knockout rule. All right, well, what do we do? Whose rules apply for how long you had to inspect them? The court's gonna use the gap filler provisions. And in this situation, you'll say, all right, well, UCC doesn't have an automatic gap filler provision for what is the time for inspection. So in that situation, you look to, was it reason, a court would look to, was the time that he inspected them reasonable? In this situation, it was seven days. Okay. Well, is seven days de facto reasonable? I don't know. Right. If, so th in that situation, you have to look to what's at the, what's the party's past course of dealing? What's the usage of trade in this particular industry is seven days within that period reasonable? Is it not? Are we talking about, are these widgets perishable goods? In which case, I think seven days would be a long time to wait to inspect. But if it's widgets or microprocessors, you know, seven days is probably pretty reasonable. So this is a good example of a situation in which you're really looking at the facts. And as we know, the law can say whatever it wants, but 99% of the time, the case comes down to the facts. Miles, that goes back to you. And I'm mindful that we're on time. I'll just explain, I think, what's in the remainder of the slides that you guys have um, in front of you or in your possession. Um, scenario in the next hypothetical, if you, if you think about the fact pattern that I described earlier, in this scenario, our seller order acknowledgement didn't include the magic language. It was not conditional. It forms a contract under 2071. But in this, in seller standard terms, it tried to disclaim consequential damages. There was no term in the buyer's PO that dealt with the topic of consequential damages. But as we discussed, Jungle Gym Company is exposed to some serious consequential damages because it's relying on these tire swings to fill customer orders. If you play this forward um, and your disclaimer of the consequential damages in the seller uh, acknowledgement is treated as an additional term, it's going to get that treatment 
under the provisions that Zan explained earlier for whether that additional term is material. Um, courts are likely to find something like a disclaimer of such important damages under those circumstances, particularly where the used tire company knows that its buyer is exposed to its own customers in reliance on used tires performance as a material term, and they're not likely to include that as part of the contract. Uh, so that's the scenario there. Zan, you want to give a quick run through with that last one before we let everybody off the hook? Yeah, I think I think we should. So just the uh, next slide, please. So we won't run through this all. This is just another example of 2207 and how con uh, 2273, I'm sorry, and how conduct can manifest the existence of a contract. And I think the point of this slide is you can have a situation in which there's not a contract under 22071, but under 22073, if the conduct of the parties shows that there is one, then you could still enforce it. So let's jump to the next and we'll let you guys out of here. We just have some closing remarks. Yeah, the last two slides really, I think you can all reference for yourselves. Summary of what we talked about, the details in the slides, and some best practices for avoiding this scenario, which is ultimately the conclusion, right? A lot of times you want your terms to apply. There are ways to avoid some of this happening uh, if you set procedures in place and terms in place that are correct uh, with knowledge of these rules. So uh, we may have a question. We'll follow up with the question asker uh, with an answer afterward. I know you guys need to take a break before the next session. Thank you very much for joining us and feel free to, to reach out to us with any questions. Thank you, everyone.